turn to Lord's Day 19 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, we consider tonight's question and answer 50 and 51. Why is it added, and sitteth at the right hand of God? Because Christ is ascended into heaven for this end, that he might appear as head of his church, by whom the Father governs all things. What profit is this glory of Christ our head unto us? First, that by his Holy Spirit he pours out heavenly graces upon us his members, and then that by his power he defends and preserves us against all enemies. Lord's Day 19, beloved, brings us to the third step in Christ's exaltation. First, he rose from the dead. Second, he ascended into heaven. And third, he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We call that his session, his sitting at God's right hand. And there's one step which is yet to come, and that is his return as judge on the last day. Now we saw that his ascension tells us how it came to be that he is in heaven, and tells us what his position is, that is to say he is no longer upon the earth, but he is in heaven. But his session tells us something more. It tells us not only is he in heaven, but tells us which position exactly he has in heaven. And then we also consider in the Heidelberg Catechism, since we have learned that he has this glorious position, what benefit or advantage is his glory to us. Consider the glory of Christ our head. The glory of Christ our head. Notice first his exalted position, then his awesome power, and thirdly his beneficial rule. The fact that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty tells us that Christ has the highest possible position in heaven. It is called the right hand of God. Now we know, of course, that the right hand of God is not so much a physical location as it is a position of honor or glory. Because we know that God does not have a right hand in the way we might understand a hand. He does not have a hand of flesh and bones, which is in a physical place. Because he is a pure spirit who fills heaven and earth. But hand in the Bible speaks of power. And by God's hand, he exercises his power in the creation. The hand of God is his omnipotence. And the right hand of a person is a position of honor and privilege. If you wish to honor someone, you place that person at your right hand. We have an expression, he's my right hand man, a king places a person at a banquet, let's say, at his right hand, the person he desires to honor with the highest honor on that occasion. And Christ is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, which means Jesus Christ, the man, Jesus Christ, the mediator, has the privileged position the most honored position in heaven, and one which only he is able to occupy. And at the right hand of God, Jesus Christ rules over all things. We have that in question answer 50 at the end. 
by whom the Father governs all things. But this leads us to the question, are you saying that God has abdicated? That God has stopped ruling the universe for a time and has instead said that now I will stop ruling and I will give the rule into the hand of Jesus Christ. Is that what we mean when we say that Christ is at the right hand of God? Is that what Christ meant when he said in Matthew 28, all power, and that word power means authority, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Did God, when Jesus Christ ascended and sat at the right hand of God, did God cease to rule the universe? And of course the answer to that is no. God still rules the universe. God meaning the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit still rules the universe. There are two very similar words in English and if we understand them it gives us an idea of what Christ's rule means. We have a vice regent. A vice regent is someone who rules in the place of a ruler who is for some reason unable to rule by himself. Perhaps the king, the rightful king, is too young. And so there is a vice regent appointed to rule until the king grows up and then he will be able to rule by himself. Or perhaps the king is too old and appoints this vice regent to rule until he dies. And this vice regent then is, as it were, being trained in how to be king. Or perhaps the king is incapacitated some way. There was a time in English history, for example, when the king was mad and they had to appoint a vice regent. But Jesus Christ is not a vice regent because the triune God has not become incapacitated in some way, so he is not able to rule the universe himself. Rather, he is a vice, and here's a different word, a vice gerent. G E R E N T. A vice gerent is the kind of administrator through whom the king rules. And so it's not the case that the king gives up his rule or abdicates or has some problem with his rule, but rather he gives his rule into the hands of another, and that person is the one through whom he rules his own <coughs> kingdom. And if we were to choose one of those words to describe what Jesus Christ is doing, we would say he is a vice gerent, not a vice regent. Because the triune God is still ruling, but he is pleased now to rule all things through Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus Christ is ruling the universe now at the exalted position at the right hand of God. We must stress this point because there are many Christians today who believe that Christ is not ruling yet. They believe that Christ will rule at some point in the future. Many of them are dispensationalists. They believe that Christ came the first time with the purpose of ruling. That was the plan, as it were. And then the Jews rejected the offer of Jesus Christ to be a ruler and his kingdom has been postponed. And what he's doing in heaven, I'm not quite sure according to their scheme, but he's not ruling. He's waiting. He's waiting until the last day when he shall return and then during this earthly millennium which they believe, then he will rule and only for 1,000 years. But that's not what we believe. And that's not what the Apostles' Creed, which is the creed of all ages, that's not what the Apostles' Creed teaches. Because we believe, and the Bible teaches us very clearly, that Jesus Christ is already ruling. Other Christians believe 
that the devil is ruling right now. That when man fell into sin, that God gave the world and everything in it over to the devil, and the devil is now the ruler and the God of this world, and that Christ will rule when he returns on the last day. But in the meantime, the devil is ruling the universe. I remember I had Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe this too. They came to my door and they told me, am I looking forward to the rule of Jesus Christ? And I said, but Jesus Christ is ruling now. And they, oh no he's not. No, no, the devil is ruling now. He will rule in the future. And I said, well when did God abdicate? They weren't able to answer me. Because God never abdicated. He never gave the power of anything into the devil. And Jesus says, all power, all authority is given unto me. Not will in the future sometime be given unto me, but is right now given unto me in heaven and on earth. And that's what Paul says too at the end of Ephesians 1. He says in verse 20, that God has set him, that is Jesus, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. He says that God has set him far above all of these other powers. He says in verse 22 that he has put all things, notice past tense, he has put all things under his feet. And has given him to be the head over all things to the church. This has happened already. This is not something which will happen in the future. So we believe, in keeping with the Apostles' Creed, we believe that Christ is ruling right now. He has been ruling as the mediator in his exaltation from the time when he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. We see that in that phrase, he sitteth. He sitteth. The idea of sitting there is, first of all, he has finished the work which God gave him to do. If he had not finished it, he would not be sitting down. A king sits on a throne. And the servants, they stand to attention around him, waiting for orders to come from the king. Or they fall down in humble adoration before him and they worship him. Jesus is sitting. The angels are standing. The saints are falling before him in humble adoration. And the idea of sitting is also of permanence. He is sitting there because he has no intention of standing up and going anywhere. This is a permanent sitting on a throne. And he will sit there and he will govern the universe from that position of sitting on a throne at the right hand of God. He will sit there until the time comes when he is ready to stand up again and to return to this earth as the judge of the living and the dead. So it's one thing, beloved, for Christ to be in heaven, that's wonderful. Christ was on earth, Christ suffered and died, Christ was in the tomb, Christ is now in heaven. But it's even better and even more wonderful to be in heaven at the highest possible position at God's right hand. Think about heaven for a moment. Who is in heaven? Well, the triune God's in heaven. And the angels and the archangels are in heaven and the departed saints are in heaven. But who is above all in heaven? Who has the highest position in heaven? Jesus Christ. That's the answer that we have in our Heidelberg Catechism. That's the answer we have in the Apostles' Creed. That's the answer we have in the Word of God. Paul talks about that in Ephesians chapter 1 at the end. He says about Jesus Christ that he has been placed, quote, far above, and that word literally is hyper above, far above, not simply above, but far above, all principality and power and might.
right and dominion. And those words are simply describing various ranks of heavenly beings and angels. We know about angels from the Bible. We know there are cherubim and there are seraphim. We know there are archangels, for example, Gabriel and Michael. And these are various ranks in the angelic world. Now where does Jesus fit into this? He is far above all of them. Peter says something similar in 1 Peter 3, verse 22. Speaking about Jesus, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So of all the inhabitants of heaven, Jesus Christ is far above all of them. Far above all of the angels, the archangels, and all the saints. And no one is his equal in heaven. Since he's far above all them, it stands to reason he is far above all earthly powers as well. Because what can be compared to heavenly powers? He's far above all men. He's far above all kings, all presidents, all prime ministers. He's far above people who call themselves the most powerful men in the world. And the moment there is an election going on in America, to decide who will be the next president. He calls himself the most powerful man in the world. He is over the biggest army in the world, let's say. Nothing, nothing in comparison to Jesus Christ. He is far above all the leagues of nations, the European Union, or the UN, or NATO. Far above all those. He is also far above all the devils, the devil himself, all of the demons. Every earthly, every heavenly, every infernal power, he is far above all of them. He is also, says Ephesians 1, far above all names that might be named. God has given unto him above every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Remind us of Philippians chapter 2. He has a name which is above every name. Think of any title that man might be given. Your Majesty, Mr. President, Your Excellency. Jesus Christ is above all such titles. His name is higher than any other name. His name is Lord. That's what Philippians 2 says. That everyone might confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the Greek word kurios, which means sovereign ruler and owner of all things. And there was a controversy in the early church over this. Caesar, the emperor of Rome, he wanted to call himself Koios or Lord. And the early Christians were confronted with this question. Who is Lord? Who is Koios? Is it Caesar or is it Jesus? And those who answered wrongly, according to Rome, the Roman Empire, were put to death for denying that Caesar is Lord, for confessing that Jesus is Lord. And this will never change because it says in verse 21, not only in this world or in this age, but also in that which is to come. Jesus will always have this name which is exalted above all other names. Jesus will never be deposed from his position at the right hand of God. Jesus will never be deprived of this position. No one is going to come along later who is more glorious or more worthy of this position and remove Jesus Christ. 
he has the name. Far above all other names in this world and the world which is to come. And the mysterious thing and the difficult thing for us to understand is that the one who is thus exalted is the Son of God in our human nature. The same one who was humbled, who was humiliated, who entered the state of humiliation and had those various steps, you remember the steps of humiliation, is now the same one who is exalted. And that, of course, is fitting. The only one who could ever be exalted to the right hand of God the Father Almighty must himself be God. Because God will not give a position of honour at his right hand to someone who is merely a creature. And yet, this person must also be man because God, remember, cannot be exalted because God is God. He is infinitely glorious in himself. He does not require to be exalted. In fact, he is unchangeable. And so it would be inconceivable for God to raise to this high honour and position of glory a mere man, or even an angel, let's say. Because that would be for God to say that this mere man or this angel is equal with me, God. And God cannot do that because that would be for God to deny himself. And so the one who was humble is the same one who was exalted. Not just any man, but the Son of Man, the Son of God made flesh. He is exalted. The one who was born in Bethlehem is now the one who is at the right hand of God. The one who grew up in Nazareth and walked the streets of Galilee. The one who was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, who was arrested, who was spat upon and beaten, who was denied by Peter, who was tried as a criminal and condemned to death and crucified and buried. The one who bore in his own body our sins and who experienced the hellish agonies of the cross, he is the one now. He is the one who is exalted to the highest possible position at the right hand of God. And in this way, God has fulfilled his covenant. His purpose was to exalt man to the highest possible degree. It was not his purpose to exalt man to the highest possible degree through Adam, because Adam was merely a creature. His purpose was to exalt man to the highest possible degree in the Son of God. And so his plan was always to send Jesus Christ. And in exalting Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has exalted all those who are in him, because he is our head, and we are his members. Which is why Paul can say in the very next chapter that we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 6 of chapter 2, and have raised us up together together, that is, with Christ, and hath made us sit together, again, together with Christ, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so we are exalted in Christ, but not that we become God, not that, but that we are honoured with the honour of Jesus Christ. This, of course, this exaltation at the right hand of God is not something which is natural to Jesus Christ. On the one hand, of course, Jesus Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity. And that's his natural deity and glory and power. But the Bible makes clear 
that here God is giving this power and this glory and this authority and this honor to the man Jesus Christ. And so this is a glorification of the Son of God according to his human nature. You see, the Son of God, as the second person of the Trinity, already has almighty power. But Jesus Christ does not have naturally almighty power, and in fact, he cannot ever have almighty power, because God cannot give almighty power to a creature. And the human nature of Jesus Christ cannot become Almighty, because then it would be receiving an incommunicable attribute of God. Can we understand this fully? No, we cannot. We can understand this. The one at the right hand of God is a real and a complete man with a real human nature but not with an omnipotent or almighty human nature and certainly not with an ubiquitous human nature as the Lutherans try to say. Rather it is a glorified and exalted human nature and the Son of God is exalted to the highest possible degree in our human nature. And this happened, this exaltation of the man Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God in our flesh, this happened by the almighty power of God. That's the emphasis in Ephesians 1 again. Verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? There are three words in that one verse for the power of God. The working, the energy of his power, the might of his power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's why Jesus Christ came to be exalted at the highest position in heaven. By the almighty power of God, taking hold of the man Jesus Christ, who was under the power of death, raising him by that almighty power from the grave, and then exalting him to the highest possible position in heaven. <sighs> and the awesome thing about this is, according to the Apostle Paul in chapter 1, this power which raised Jesus Christ from the dead and which has placed him now at his own right hand in heaven is the same power which is at work in us which causes us to believe. It's not that easy to believe, you know. In fact, it's impossible for a sinner to believe the gospel. You have to have, working in a sinner, the almighty power of God. Which is why our hands of Dort say that regeneration is not inferior to the work of creating all things in the beginning or raising Jesus Christ from the dead. It has its eye on this passage, beloved. That's the power that's at work in us. That power, according to chapter 2, is the work which quickens us from the dead, raises us from spiritual death, and exalts us and makes us sit in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. That's his awesome position at the right hand of God. Now what does Jesus Christ do at the right hand of God? And the Catechism says... He governs all things. He governs all things. This means that all of history is under the sovereign control of Jesus 
Right. Nothing, beloved, nothing in all of history occurs except to be according to the will of Jesus Christ. It's not the case, therefore, that history simply moves on randomly according to the laws of science or chance. History is under the direct control of Jesus Christ. Nor is history under the control of man, so that God is waiting for man to make decisions. And then he reacts to those decisions in the history of the world. Or even that the world's history is open, and God is waiting for man to do something so he knows what he will do. No. All of history is under the control of Jesus Christ. It's not either that there is this struggle going on in history between God and Satan. We wonder what the outcome is going to be, who is going to win in the end. No, all of history is under the control of Jesus Christ. Which means that all of the angels in heaven are doing the bidding of Jesus Christ. Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, who was sent by the triune God to announce the coming of Jesus Christ to Mary, now stands before Jesus Christ and waits orders and instructions from him, as do all the other angels. They serve Jesus Christ. Gladly and willingly they serve him. And so the one who was brought very, very low for our salvation, who was mocked and crucified and died, he is now in control of all things, things in heaven and things on the earth. That's what he said to his disciples, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And so, without the will of Christ, nothing moves on the face of the earth. Not that, as we say, Jesus Christ rules independently of the triune God, but rather that the triune God is pleased to rule all things through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus Christ perfectly fulfills the will of the triune God, because the will of Jesus Christ is in perfect harmony with the will of the triune God. So all the decisions that Christ makes, all of the commandments that Christ gives, all of the rulings which Christ proclaims are in perfect harmony with the will of God. And in fact, his position at the right hand of God is a reward for what he has suffered in his humiliation. And Paul speaks about this too in Ephesians 1, in verse 22. He hath put all things under his feet. That's an expression describing a reality in the ancient past. When a king would conquer a nation, let's say, he would bring the rulers of that conquered nation and place them before him, and then he would put his feet upon their neck and use them as a footstool to show his absolute authority over them and their absolute submission to him. And that's the idea here. All things have been placed under the feet of Jesus Christ. And so nothing is able to move because everything is under the feet. It is a footstool, you might say, to Jesus Christ. Some people are willingly under the feet of Jesus Christ. He has conquered them by grace. We are those people. We willingly submit to his rule as our king and as our lord. Others submit <coughs> unwillingly, and he rules them with a rod of iron. Not that one day God will put all things under his feet, but that already all things are under 
his feet. Again, you see, Christ's kingdom has not been postponed. The only thing that you might say is to come <coughs> is a public acknowledgement of the fact that all things are under his feet. And then, as Philippians 2 tells us, on the last day, when Jesus Christ returns, every tongue will confess what has already been declared, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and every knee will bow, whether they want to bow or not, every knee will have to bow, because no one will be able to question the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. And those who refuse to repent and believe in Jesus Christ in this life will be forced by the awesomeness of the King when he appears to bow themselves before Jesus Christ and to confess that he is Lord to their utter consternation and shame. That includes the devil himself. The devil will have to bow his knee to Jesus Christ and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a very striking passage in the book of Revelation that tells us something about how Jesus Christ is ruling at the right hand of God. Revelation 5 and 6, we will not read that all, all of that, but we look at some aspects of it for a few moments. In Revelation 5, we have a vision which God has in which he sees God in heaven carrying or holding in his hand a book or a scroll. And this scroll or book has seven seals. It's written all over on both sides, so there's not anything where there's a space where nothing has been written. And in this book, there is written everything which God has planned for history. And especially this, everything which concerns the covenant of God. Because as you'll notice, there are seven seals. And seven is the number of God's covenant friendship with his people. And so this book, in the hand of the Almighty, contains everything that must come to pass in order to bring to full fruition the kingdom and covenant of God with God's elect people. And the question which is posed in chapter 5 is, who shall be worthy to open this book? And who shall be able to open the seals of it? so that what has been written in this book will come to pass. And the question goes out to all the universe. Is there anyone in heaven? Is there anyone on earth? Is there anyone under the earth who is worthy to approach the triune God, to take the book from his hand, and to begin to open the seals of the book and thus to bring to realization the purpose and counsel of God concerning his covenant. And there is no one who was found worthy. And at that point, John the Apostle, who is observing this in a vision, starts to cry. He cries, he sobs bitterly because he understands if there is no one worthy to open the book, then God's purpose of realizing his eternal friendship with his people cannot come to pass. And after the challenge goes forth, and no one comes to accept the challenge, and after John has been sobbing, an angel says to him, he should stop crying because the Lion of Judah has been found worthy. And John turns, expecting to see a majestic lion approach the throne. And instead he sees a lamb. 
And a lamb that has the wound of one who has been slaughtered. And he's told, this lamb, he has been found worthy. And this shows us that by his suffering and death, by his being slaughtered as a lamb, he has done that which was necessary to bring to realization the contents of the book. Why? Because we, God's elect people, are those who are to be brought into covenant fellowship with God, and we cannot be thus brought into covenant fellowship with God unless our sins are dealt with, and no one in heaven, on the earth, or under the earth, was able to deal with our sins, and thus enable us to enter covenant fellowship with God. That is, no one except Jesus Christ himself who suffered on the cross for our sins. And thus because of that, and that's what they sing in heaven, verse 9 of chapter 5, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And so Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who is the Lion of Judah, Jesus Christ takes the book, and what does he do with the book? He starts to open the seven seals. And the book of Revelation, in chapter 6 in particular, describes to us what happens when the Lamb who is Jesus Christ, now exalted at the right hand of God, what happens when the Lamb starts to open these seven seals? The first one unleashes upon the earth a white horse, and a rider upon the white horse. And this white horse refers to the victorious preaching of the gospel as it gathers God's people throughout the history of the world. And the other horses follow that first white horse. There's a red horse that refers to war. There's a black horse that refers to economic turmoil in the history of man. And there's the pale horse, and that refers to all manner of death. And notice who sends war economic up and downturn and death of all kinds upon the earth. Who? Is it the devil? No, it is the lamb. The lamb at the right hand of God. He opens the seals and he sends these things upon the earth. And all of these things are contained in the book with the seven scrolls, which tells us that all of these things are necessary for the bringing to pass of God's purpose of realizing his covenant with his elect church. It's not that these things are bumps along the road or blips. These are part of what God has purposed for history. These are necessary. We might think, well, the white horse, surely that's necessary for the fruition of the covenant. We understand that. The white horse, the gathering of the church and the preaching of the gospel, we can understand that. But what about war? Well, war is necessary for the realization of God's covenant. And so is death. And so is economic turmoil in the history of the nations. We might not understand exactly why that is the case, but the Bible tells us it is the case. And we should not therefore fear when war or economic chaos happen in the history of this world. We have a great benefit, beloved, that we have at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, none other than Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is our head. Our head. That's 
the emphasis of the Catechism as well. Answer 15. Because Christ is ascended into heaven for this end, that he might appear as head of his church. And then question 51. What profit is this glory of Christ our head unto us? Turn back to Ephesians 1 verse 22. It says, And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Remember what a head is. A head is the source of life for the members of the body. Christ the head is in heaven. His life flows to the members who are on earth. His life flows to us through the Holy Spirit by the bond of faith, which the Holy Spirit creates between us and Jesus Christ. And as the head, he is the sympathetic and loving head, as Paul describes him in Ephesians 5. He nourishes and cherishes his body. And he is also, as the head, the representative head. He did not ascend into heaven, nor does he sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty for himself. He does that for his elect church. He is not therefore a private person. Where Christ is, the church is represented. That was the case in his incarnation. He became incarnate in order to represent us. That was the case in the whole of his life. That was the case in his death and his resurrection and his ascension and now in his session. And so now, with Christ at the right hand of God, in everything that he does, he is thinking about and is concerned for us, his members who are on the earth. That's why Paul says in verse 22 of Ephesians 1, Give him to be the head over all things to, to the church. That's a dative of advantage. The idea being he gave him to the advantage or the benefit or the good of the church. You see, we, the church, need Christ to be the head over all things. It's not so much that Christ needs to be the head over all things. We need him to be the head over all things because we need him to rule over all things for our salvation. And that's why the Catechism asks, what profit is this glory of Christ our head? unto us. And so Christ's rule at the right hand of God is not, we might say, selfish. He isn't concerned about his own glory as he is at the right hand of God. He is concerned about two things. First of all, he is concerned about the glory of God. That is his motive in all things. And it must be our motive in all things as well. And second, and closely connected to that, he is concerned for the salvation of his church. Think of politicians. They like to campaign. They get a lot of donations from big donors. And then they are exalted to a position when they are elected. They become president, let's say, or a senator, or congressman, or something else, a TV. And usually, they rule selfishly for their own glory, for their own monetary gain. Or they are ruling with an agenda. They are indebted to lobbyists, let's say. And they're easily corrupted by such lobbyists. The one who gives them the most money is the one who will convince them to vote the way that they want him to vote. 
But Christ uses his position to help his church. To help those who cannot offer him a bride, you might say. Who cannot give him anything. Who are in themselves utterly helpless and who do not deserve his salvation. And so God's concern in every part of the life and the death and then the exaltation of Jesus Christ, every part of his ministry is his church. And Christ never forgets his people. Even when he is at the right hand of the Father, of the Father Almighty, he doesn't say, well, I haven't made it. I don't care about my church any longer. I will just bask in my glory. No, that's not Christ's attitude. Because Christ loves his church. And Christ is the husband of his church. And that's our comfort. We can say that the one who is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the one who has all power in heaven and in earth, is not the devil who is our mortal enemy. That's no comfort is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who loves us. Jesus Christ who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. And if you know that the most powerful person is on your <coughs> side, you could have comfort. If you know that Jesus Christ who controls all things, and that even things which we might say are negative in our lives are under the control of Jesus Christ and we know they all work together for our good. We have no reason whatsoever to fear. We're told that in our Heidelberg Catechism that from his position in heaven, Christ protects and defends and preserves his church. He's in heaven. He is surrounded by angels and archangels. Men and angels are worshipping him day after day and night after night. And he remembers his poor, beleaguered, persecuted church upon the earth. And he uses his position of power in heaven to stretch forth his mighty arm to defend us. And even our enemies are under his sovereign control at the right hand of God. They cannot so much as move without his bidding. And also, says the Catechism, he pours out heavenly graces and gifts upon us. One gift which Paul mentions in Ephesians 4, 11 is the gift of pastors and teachers. He gives his church office bearers Give them the comfort of the word of God. He pours out upon them the Holy Spirit, giving them the ability to fight against sin and to lead lives which are holy and pleasing unto God. And he is working in heaven, working out history so that one day we will all his members be with him. In a certain sense, Christ sat down at the right hand of God in heaven, and he is already preparing <coughs> to come back. He is not content, you see, to sit in heaven, enjoying the glory of his exalted position. He is preparing a place for us, and he longs to have us be with him. And the only reason, beloved, that he has not yet returned is that all things are not yet ready for his church to be with him. The elect have not yet all of them been gathered. The sufferings of the church have not yet filled up. And the iniquity of the wicked has not reached the brim. But when those things happen, according to the will and sovereign providence of God, then Christ will return. 
and take us to be with himself. And so, beloved, we need not fear. We need not fear when we see things happening in the world that are, from every earthly perspective, frightening to us. Jesus Christ is the King of the universe. All power in heaven and earth belong to him. He has been given by God perfect wisdom and all the gifts necessary to preserve and defend every member of the church. And so instead of fearing, we have faith, we have confidence. Because Christ is at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, nothing in all the universe can harm us. Nothing can separate us from Christ our head and we have this assurance that he is working all things so that we will be with him. And then the head, the body, and every member will be one in heaven. Amen. Pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee and we rejoice in the glory of Christ our head. The one who died on the cross for us who loved us is now at thy right hand, ordaining, controlling, and governing all things for our good. Help us, Father, to believe this, to live out of such a confidence, and therefore not to fear, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.